In terms of other interesting uh, targets, therapeutic targets for patients with CLL, there, were, there, are, there are other um, drugs under development. Maybe, Matt, you can comment on some of the other interesting targets that we should be looking out for for potentially next approvals. So we've, we've hit some of them already. Um, you know, I think one other target within the B-cell receptor pathway to mention is SIC, uh, mm -hmm. the spleen tyrosine kinase. Uh, there is a drug endosplatinib. We've seen some additional data here at the ASH meeting. Um, nothing too different from what we've seen before. It's clearly an active agent. We do see some of the immune-mediated toxicities as well, although not to the same degree as what we've seen with the Delta uh, P3 kinase inhibitors. Uh, one thing to bear in mind with the apoptosis pathway is that BCL2 is not the only potential target. Mm -hmm. And in fact, as we selectively target BCL2, we do worry that we may, may see upregulation of other anti-apoptotic proteins. So there are now MCL1 inhibitors which have entered the clinic, mm -hmm. uh, and it's possible we'll see BCL-XL inhibitors mm -hmm. in the future. And eventually, we may have a whole toolkit of, of agents to target the apoptotic pathway, which is exciting. Uh, CAR T-cell therapy has uh, been very successful in lymphoma. Uh, there's certainly been some promising responses in CLL as well, but the data are, are more early there. Uh, and I think we need to see more data in CAR T-cells before that's going to become more of a routine part of our CLL practice. Uh, so those would be some of the more um, interesting new targets I can think of. Maybe you've done a lot of work with the BH3 profile, et cetera. Your understanding of venetoclax resistance, mechanism of venetoclax resistance, maybe you can comment on that. Yeah, so I mean, I think with, with brutinib, it was pretty clear early on these BTK mutations developed, and uh, it was a very clear pathway for resistance. Unfortunately, we haven't seen a similar story evolving yet with venetoclax. Uh, we did see some abstracts presented at this meeting that, that looked at mutational profiles in a more limited number of patient samples, and there was no clear answer as to what was the, the cause of resistance. It's not like we saw BCL2 mutations or anything like this. So I think it remains a bit of an unknown. I think from sort of this functional perspective, we can imagine these other anti-apoptotic proteins being upregulated, MCL1, BCL, XL, but we don't have a lot of data yet in patients to, to prove that. And targeting those? Targeting those, I think, is a, is a very promising approach, um, but the drugs really have just entered the clinic, so whether that's even a safe approach, we don't know yet. Shao, maybe you can comment on the checkpoint inhibitors. What's our understanding of check, the activity of checkpoint inhibitors in CLL, and where are we going with those? Right. The Mill Clinic presented a very interesting study uh, enrolling patients with uh, relapsed refractory CLL as well as Richter transformation with uh, pembrolizumab. Um, so their observation is very interesting in that uh, the CLL patient actually did, did not respond mm -hmm. to the P1 antibody. However, the large cell lymphoma, diffuse large B cell lymphoma component of the Richter transformation responded 40% uh, of overall response rate among those patients. And even in those patients, their CLL component did not respond, their large cell lymphoma component responded. So I think definitely that raises a question whether we can incorporate the uh, uh, PD-1 blockade uh, to as combination therapy with something else to treat Richter transformation, which is an area of huge and medical need. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Nicole, there are now three approved CD20 antibodies. We have rituximab, which was the initial drug that we had and clearly showed improvement in outcomes with chemotherapy in patients with CLL. Ofatumumab, we have obinutuzumab, which appears to be better when combined with chlorambucil than rituximab. Ublituximab is another one that we've seen some data uh, about. Can you maybe comment on different CD20 antibodies where they may be useful? Yeah. Is there a difference in effectiveness? I mean, you know, uh, certainly the, the clinical data has shown that obinutuzumab in some of the randomized studies when it's been compared to rituximab, whether it be with chlorambucil in particular, <laughs> there's no doubt that there was improved responses mm -hmm. and even some MRD negativity in, in that study as compared to the chlorambucil rituximab arm. So there's no doubt that I think we're seeing a clearer signal that obinutuzumab gives higher response rates. Is that all a across the board, hard to know. Um, there's not a lot of head-to-head -head randomized data, but certainly there is some. Um, so that's, I think that's why a lot of, you know, certainly there's been a lot more studies involving the combination of, a, you know, whether it be venetoclax or another agent with obinutuzumab. Certainly we still have those combinations with rituximab. Um, and now you have ublituximab, which is very similar to obinutuzumab in mechanism, and certainly that data looks uh, promising as well. I guess the question that always arises in my head is, you know, how many monoclonal CD20 antibodies do we need? Um, <laughs> I, I don't mean to be mean or negative. I guess the point being is that we have cost issues to deal with. And so there's that that we have to face. If it's clearly dramatically better, I think that we should push to use one particular antibody versus 
you know, sort of what we're doing, which is a smattering in the U.S. rituximab is still the most widely used monoclonal antibody. I think there will be re reimbursement issues, or it depends on the hospital and the formularies of which antibody they will pay for. Mm -hmm. And then there are biosimilars and then subcutaneous rituximab. So how that will be incorporated is a whole other thing, because obviously that may less chair time, less... You know, so I think that um, there are lots of CD20 monoclonal antibodies. I think clearly there are some that are probably more potent, and um, but the question is in practice, you know, how will we incorporate them will be, remains to be seen. What, and what about toxicities? Is there a difference? There's more infusion-related toxicities with the, with the more potent antibodies, but they're generally, I mean, if you get somebody through that first infusion, they're generally well-tolerated, so you, you up the ante on the antihistamines and the steroids, um, and most people do fine, and you split the dose, and so you can work around once they get through that at first infusion, but certainly we do see a little bit more of that, a little bit more neutropenia, mm -hmm. um, but those are manageable. Mm -hmm. One interesting observation from the combination study is that when you're combining with arbutinib, especially with a lead-in arbutinib, there seem to be less infusion reaction with right. the albuminum. Certainly, that has come yeah. out with some of the mm -hmm. data. Yes, yeah. right. Although that's not a not of care yet, yeah. <laughs> it's still in the clinical trial phase. Yes, I, I can speak to that briefly since I'm presenting a poster tonight <laughs> uh, at this ASH meeting where we did a randomization actually, and we treated uh, one group of patients with obinutuzumab alone, followed by combination with arbutinib. Second group with arbutinib first alone, followed by the combination, and the third group we started both simultaneously. And we actually saw 63% of the patients in that first arm where they started with the antibody alone had infusion reactions, and only one out of the 16 patients in the other two arms had, had reactions. So it does seem to help to start the abrutinib first, or at least simultaneously with the antibody. One thing to, I think, to bring up is just to remind ourselves that when we're looking at the data or here, listening to the presentations of you know, big trials is also focus on the quality of life issues, mm -hmm. really Good important too. components of all of our trials, how do our Patients but tolerate these. the patient reported outcomes. Yeah, data. the patient reported outcomes. We have some data from uh, from this meeting, uh, mm -hmm. looking at those in the context of our novel therapy trials. Uh, it's a really interesting uh, publication just very recently in Blood Advances that was uh, a survey tool that was used uh, to send to patients, asking them what's important to them. Uh, is it uh, oral versus IV, uh, side effect profile, uh, efficacy? And I, I refer, you know, colleagues to, to, to look at that carefully. It's, it's pretty uh, revealing. I think it, it shows that still, number one, is they want to see that their cancer is controlled for, uh, you know, the longest time possible. And they're willing to tolerate some side effects in exchange, but not, you know, not too many. So uh, it's really, really important as we develop these new therapies and the combinations. Uh, you mentioned the ibrutinib and venetoclax, very, very well tolerated. So that's, that's an important uh, finding. You know, and there's very good, I mean, the presentation, right, Dr. Roback present, the patient reported outcomes, mm, you know, yeah. even long-term monotherapy with yeah. ibrutinib is very well tolerated. Very and well most tolerated. patients report very good quality of life in addition to the, you know, efficacy and their hematologic parameters improve, but they're actually, you know, their quality of life is improving too. So we have to keep that in mind because that's just monotherapy.